The learning disability is the weapon of mass destruction that they use all over black Florida to give your black child an inferior education with your permission. Another one, serious emotional disturbance. Another one, mild mental retardation. And the newest one, ain't no daddy at a home disorder. Well, what the hell you mean, brother? I'm a whole tech father. I'm in the house, brother. My son still got ADHD, brother. You don't know what you're talking about. Okay. Then in your cases, ain't no discipline at home disorder. <laughs> nah, brother. You wrong, brother. I'm home and I give out discipline in my house, brother. So that ADHD stuff don't mean nothing in my house, my brother. Well, in your case, then it becomes artificial diet at home disorder. <laughs> nah, brother. We do veggie wraps, brother. I'm a shake butter, brother. <laughs> Ain't no sugar in my house, brother. We hold tempers in this family. <laughs> really? Then it becomes attachment disruption due to home dysfunction. Wow. In other words, you and the mother not getting along and y'all arguing in front of them children and they going to school with emotional dysfunctions by being raised in an unhappy home. Mm -hmm. In other words, if it ain't the first ADHD, it's the second. And if it ain't the second, it's the third. Mm -hmm. And if it ain't the third, it's the fourth. Uh -huh. When did we get ADD? 1980. The American Psychiatric Association, in collaboration with the CIA and FBI, mm -hmm. started mass incarcerating black males selling crack that the CIA brought to our communities. And as a result of the mass incarceration of black males, tens of thousands of black boys were left without a father. Now, the government knew that this hyperactive emotional problem was nothing more than an attachment disruption because you stole my daddy from my home. But rather than give a boy his daddy back, we just want to take him to the doctor. In other words, they made up ADHD as a fake disorder to get paid off of fatherless black boys. And the sad thing about it is they got y'all believing it. Some of your sons have been taking drugs for the past 5, 10, 15, 20 years. What is wrong with you, mother and father? I don't understand black folks. Why would you go to white folks to solve a black problem? Mm. <laughs> he don't need no medicine. All he need is a strong black male teacher. That's all he need. You can fix every school in Fort Lauderdale. Test scores too low, I got a solution. High school dropout is too high, I got a solution. Too much hooking in and cutting and gang banging, I got a solution. Give every black boy in South Florida a strong black male teacher. Yeah. But you're not going to do that because you depend on the schools to fell out children. Because without failing schools, there cannot be no mass incarceration system. So the school must spell black children in order for you to be able to lock up grown black males. Mm. And another reason why we don't see more push to get black men in the schools is because the white racist females who run the schools don't want them in there. I'm going to call it like I see it. I'm going to call it like I see it. The problem is real simple. The reason your children are struggling ain't got nothing to do with you being poor. Nothing to do with his dad being in jail. Nothing to do with the schools being underfunded. Nothing to do with the teachers being paid too less. The reason your son isn't learning is because the person standing in front of him could care less if he learned at all. It is a crime to let a member of the oppressor class teach a child of the oppressed class. It is a conflict of interest for a white woman to prepare a black boy to challenge her own son for economic control of South Florida. You better believe it. You better believe it. But we got a problem because in order to fight to get black men in the schools, and when I say black men, I'm talking about a certain kind of black men. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. I'm talking about an unapologetically African alpha male. I'm not talking about Duncan Hines. <laughs> <laughs> then we're not going to 
we're getting that because we're in a public facility. Okay, I'm not talking about a Duncan Hines brother. Betty Crocker brother. No sir. We're talking about backbone black males. Alright? Whatever happened to the backbone black male? Everybody got a little sugar now. Not a lot, just a little sugar. You ever see a brother walk by, you just felt his energy like, it's a little sugar, a little sugar. Uh, too much down here. But brothers and sisters, the reason we don't see more black men in the school is in order for us to get more black men in the school, your black state reps, and your black state senators, and your black council persons, and your black mayors, and your black U.S. reps, they're going to have to go to war with the white teachers union. And everybody's scared of the teachers. Everybody's scared of the teachers, brothers and sisters. What do you mean, Dr. Umar Johnson? I mean that the American Federation of Teachers and the National Education Association are the two largest teacher unions in America. They are the Democrats and Republicans of public education. And if you want to change the schools, you're going to have to go to war with them fools. Why didn't Obama do nothing about the schools? Trump won't touch me. I don't care how tough Trump talk. Trump, Trump ain't gonna change nothing about them schools. Bush didn't even change nothing about the schools. You wanna know why? Because if you wanna get elected anywhere in America, you need votes. And what union has more votes to give than any other union in this country? And that's the teachers. And guess who's after the teachers? The police. You wanna know why they don't charge police for exterminating black males? You wanna know why nobody gets uh, justice for what they do to our young brothers? It's because in order for me to change the law to hold police accountable for the killing of black folk, I'm going to put my campaign in jeopardy. There's more teachers and more police than any other professional in America. They got the votes and they got the money and they got the ability to put you out of business. These are the facts and they are undisputed. So the only way we're going to fix this then, we can't rely on the elected officials, we have to organize ourselves. And that's why I started the National Independent Black Parent Association last year, so we can organize ourselves. And our next conference is going to be in January, somewhere down here, it might even be here. Mm -hmm. And I want y'all to come so you can come and get that training from Dr. Umar so you can start a chapter. Every chapter got seven committees. Committee number one, Special Education Committee. You gotta investigate special ed in Lauder Hill. And you gotta investigate special ed in Palm Beach. And you gotta in, in, investigate special ed in Miami. Mm -hmm. How many black boys in special ed in Miami? How many black girls in special ed in Hollywood? How many black boys diagnosed with autism in Fort Lauderdale? And why don't you know? Are they in special ed full time? Are they in special ed part time? Or are they just get pulled out for a couple subjects? Are they on homebound instruction? Do they go to approved private schools? During what grade were they put in special ed? In Palm Beach, the average grade might be fourth grade when they start putting our kids through that nonsense. For a lot of Dell, it might be the sixth grade. Miami Gardens, it might be the second grade. We need to know this. And then we're going to have a school discipline committee because our children are over suspended and over expelled. How many black boys were expelled from Fort Lauderdale schools last year? How many black girls were suspended from Hollywood schools last year? See, you got to tie the suspension rate to the test scores. Because if my child ain't never allowed to be in school long enough to learn, how the hell are you going to be complaining about low test scores when you ain't leaving them in class to learn the information in the first place? Third committee, school policy. We got to change the rules in the schools that negatively affect our children. What do you mean by the rules in the schools? I mean if you live on the west side of Fort Lauderdale and you want your grandson to go to school on the east side of Fort Lauderdale because he's smart and it's a better school over there, but the principal tells you, we cannot grant your request because Raheem lives in this zip code. And because Raheem lives in this zip code, he can't go to school in that zip code. Have you heard this before? Do you know where this comes from? This comes from the 1950s and 60s. When they started desegregating the schools, they trapped us into our zip code to protect certain areas where the white folks still lived because they didn't have enough money to escape to make sure their kids could go to school by themselves. Oh yes, 
And you can fight to change that because there's no law. State of Florida has no law that says a kid got to go to school in a zip code. That's a school district policy. It is not a state law. Policies are nothing more than operating procedures. For example, your school district may have a policy that if your son is failing two major classes, he can still play on the football team. Do I agree with that? Hell no. That's nigga rights. Okay? <laughs> so what we got to do is change it so it says if you're failing any major subjects, you don't play on the football team. And for my black fathers in the room, listen, we got to stop selling our sons yes. false hope that they're going to be the next Kobe Bryant. Right. False hope the next Mike Vick. Right. If it was up to me, there wouldn't even be no NFL or NBA. I outlaw both. Why? Because the only people who benefit from black males going into the pros is white females. Right. I'm going to talk about it. Talk about it. Black man ain't got no business being with no other woman than a black woman. I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to talk about it. It's an insult. I'm going to talk about it. And I don't give a damn what that cool Roland Martin got to say. I'm going to talk about it. Did y'all hear that, Negro? Yeah. What are you talking about? What about Harry Belafonte? What about him? What the hell Harry Belafonte <laughs> did for brothers in the ghetto? Don't get me wrong. Woo. He did some good things during the civil rights struggle. I'll give the brother his props, but what has he done since Dr. King's assassination? And then he brought up Barack Obama's daddy like I know him or something. <laughs> <laughs> and then he going to bring up some damn Cindy Portier. <laughs> like, what the hell Cindy Portier ever do for the black power struggle? Woo! <laughs> black man ain't got no business being with nothing but a white woman. And the only reason why she marry anyway is because she gets a come up off of that situation. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I ain't got nothing against the white female. I wouldn't want to disrespect no women. I don't care what color they are. But because I love and I am loyal to the black woman, unapologetically so, I cannot condone my brothers dating outside of their community. You couldn't do it 50 years ago. What you wouldn't do it now for? And I don't mean no disrespect, but I don't know what the hell y'all find so attractive about those women. No disrespect. But I'm still trying to figure out the science behind your selection. See, the black woman by contraindication, she got style. Black woman got class. Black woman got a way of walking in them damn heels that'll bring out the alpha in any alpha boy. Black woman got a way of putting them jeans on. Good God, all. Black woman got a bounce when she walks. It's a bounce. Too. Got your own music. And brother, you ain't got no excuse because sisters come in every flavor. Yes. We got them all the way from little teeny lemon. <laughs> to full figured fudge. Yeah. We got butter almonds, we got butter pecans, we got sweet brown sugars, yeah. we got caramels, yeah. we got mochas and mate lattes. Yeah. <laughs> we got them petite, we got them voluptuously petite. We got Serena Williams Athletic. So it's no reason not to have one of our own. And you know what's interesting? Because I'm always in the airports flying around, right? And at this stage of the game, just about everybody know me. If a brother walking with his white woman and he sees Dr. Umar, <laughs> he will act like he not with her. Baby, I gotta go get some presents. I catch him in the supermarket.
supermarket, they get some chicken, yeah, like I get some yogurt. <laughs> Obviously, you know there's something wrong with this here. <laughs> you can never be at peace with it because if you was, you wouldn't have to shake and bake when you get around. Come on, sir. Right. Shake and bake. <laughs> oh, yeah. And you know can't nobody cook like a black woman. Listen, man. Black woman is so divine, you go into your refrigerator, you say, there's nothing in here to eat tonight. <laughs> Bam, we're done. Black woman to go in there with that bounce of hers, <laughs> open up them cabinets, and before you know it, she can put together a full course meal off the of scraps. <laughs> See, the reason why the black man don't look right with anything other than a black woman is because when you have divinity in your DNA. Mm. Right. You degrade it by associating with anything that does not. You better believe it. That's not a slight against them. It's just saying you got to know who you are. Right. What good is it for little black boys to look at black men loving up on other women? And you know what's so disrespectful about it? The black men who date white females are so intimate with these women in public it drives me insane. <laughs> And you know what's even worse? When you see a black woman coming when you're with your white queen, mm -hmm. oh, they don't yeah. even speak to the sisters. They go out of their way not to make the white woman feel inferior. Spitting on the grave of our ancestors. Could you imagine what Ida B. Wells would say to your ass if she saw you with that white woman? Could you imagine what Sojourner Truth would say to you if she saw you with that white woman? Could you imagine what Fannie Lou Hamer, Queen Mother Harriet Tubman would say to you? Now, although I do not endorse and never will endorse interracial marriage, the product of it belongs to us. My biracial brothers and sisters, you black. The problem is you won't accept it. Y'all want to keep playing the middle line. You want to be black at the Umar lecture and white as hell with your Jewish grandparents. <laughs> you got to make up your mind. The world already knows who you are. You talking about you biracial and multiracial. That don't even exist. <laughs> Listen, there's no such thing as half black and half white. How could there be? African DNA predominates all other DNA. So if I lay with a white woman, which I never would, but if I lay with a white woman and made a child, that's not a half white child. My DNA dominates hers. That baby is 99% African. I'm half white, you half crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but brothers, let me take the loyalty for black women out the occasion for a minute. Let me take the love for black women out the occasion for a minute. The reason why I disagree with interracial marriage is because all marriage is a business arrangement. Business. Marriage is business. You don't believe me? Monday morning, I want you to just sit in any divorce court. Sit there in the back. I want you to see how many divorces are dividing up love. <laughs> well, you go to divorce court, who's dividing up intimacy? <laughs> Who do you see in front of the judge talking about, I want half my commitment back? <laughs> you know what they're talking about? They're talking about homes. They're talking about cars. They're talking about bank accounts. They're talking about assets, real estate, investments. When it's time to break up, what's love got to do with it? <laughs> And that's why black men ain't got no business investing your estate, your education, your livelihood, and your retirement money into the woman of a people who have already stolen so much. Okay. Women live longer than men, South Florida. Black and white women, y'all live longer than men. It's one of the blessings of God. So if I marry a white woman, when I die, she inherits all of my estate. Everything I work for goes to a people that had already robbed, raped, stolen, and enslaved enough. Yeah. Why would I, as a black man, willingly give to my oppressor? <laughs> my life's earnings. Oh, man. And the reason you think white is because you wish it was white your damn yeah. <laughs> I'm just being honest. I'm just being honest. So white woman, I ain't got nothing against you. But because I love black women, I got to speak the truth to my brothers because they running around crazy right now. 
And that's why at the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy, the first thing I'm going to teach your son, first grade, second grade, third grade, kindergarten, preschool, I don't care how old he is, if you ever want me to look upon you as a man, then you better be with a black woman. Because any black man who ain't with a black woman ain't worthy of being called a black man. can't stand it. Any email of me? <laughs> I get two emails a day from some reactionary Negro in love with a Caucasian. <laughs> Tell my brother, listen, I have, but sometimes they be humble. They say, brother, I agree with you, brother. I just woke up. I just became conscious. Just got my shea butter and my veggie wrap last week. I'm good. <laughs> I graduated to my friend and says, this is next month. I'm almost there. <laughs> but brother, I'm married, brother. I got children. So what should I do? Leave my white wife? And you know what my answer to that is? Your mistakes should not be the burden of your children. Right. Mm -hmm. If you made babies with that white woman, then I believe you need to stay and raise them with the white woman. I would never tell the father to abandon his children. But if those kids are in high school, <laughs> on the clock, maybe we can negotiate. <laughs> But in all honesty, I don't think a father should abandon his children regardless of the cut of the mother. Stay, stay in race. Stay in race. Now let me come back to this special ed. Special education for all my parents in here is based on two laws. I want you to get them. Two laws. You're going to read this over again in my book. Two laws. And if you still don't get it, you're going to call me Tuesday. Two laws. The first law. If a child has a disability, they have a right to a free and appropriate public education. If you're taking notes, you want to write down F-A-P-E in all capitals. Free and appropriate public education. We all know what free means, right? It means you don't pay. Black people love free. <laughs> but then there's the other word, appropriate. My son has a reading disability. He'd been in special ed five years. He still ain't reading nowhere near grade level, so you're going to argue that his education is what? Not appropriate. Your son is autistic, but they got him in the class with the retarded children. Autism is not retardation. Retardation is an intellectual disability. Autism is a communications disability. You can be autistic and mentally gifted. But let me tell you what they do in Broward and Dade County because they know black parents don't know no better. Guess what? Let's say I'm a trifling principal. And I'm the principal of We Hate Black Children Charter School in South Florida. So I'm the principal of We Hate Black Children Charter School. I got two autistic kids in my school. Just two. Just two! I got 22 retarded children, which is what they now call intellectually disabled. Right? You know what I'm supposed to do? I'm supposed to pay for a new teacher just to teach those two autistic children. But I don't give a damn about them two autistic children. Mm -hmm. I don't want to spend $40,000 for another teacher to teach with two little black kids. So I'm going to bank on the fact. I'm going to roll the dice and take a gamble that their black mothers and fathers don't care about them. And I'm going to take them two little autistic kids and walk them down to the life skills class with the retarded youngsters. And I'm going to let them autistic kids get taught with the retarded kids and hope and pray to white Jesus that I never get caught. <laughs> and guess what? It happens all over the country. I know autistic kids right now sitting in a retarded class. They're not retarded at all, but the principal ain't going to spend the money for a new teacher. And so now those kids are sitting there learning nothing. And they're getting away with it because you don't care. See? The worst curse for a black child is to have a teacher who don't care about you. But a parent who couldn't care. And too often our children don't have either. They got a teacher who don't care and a parent who couldn't care less. You're part of the problem if you're not part of the solution. And this reading disability, I'm so tired of this reading disability. Do you know 80% of the kids we evaluate for special ed are evaluated for what? Reading! Special ed is mostly reading! So let me get this right. I'm related to Frederick Douglass. He taught himself how to read. There was no special ed, no public school. He could get killed, murdered, in prison for teaching himself how to read. And you want me to believe that 200 years after slavery, your child needs a special education to learn how to read when we got slaves who did it under threat of death. 
You must be outside your mind. Right. That's why when I open up the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy, guess what I'm going to do the first thing? I'm going to come into the auditorium and I'm going to bring all my slow children in here. If you got any type of label, you're going to come for a special meeting with Dr. Umar. Hmm. I want my retarded kids, autistic, ADHD, conduct disorder, ODD, math disabled, reading disabled, emotionally disturbed, and I'm going to say, you all are slow. Your parents believe you can't learn without special help from special white people. So guess what? At this school, we don't have no special ed. And I believe you fake in the funk. So this is what I'm going to do. Since you're so slow and need so much help, the other kids go to school from Monday to Friday. You go to school from Sunday to Sunday. And how much y'all want to bet? After 30 damn days, I won't have no ADHD. I won't have no conduct disorder. I won't have no reading problems. <laughs> because after being in school psychology for 20 years, I have learned our children out to a science. So when I sit down, I know if you're faking the funk. Which is why I always tell your children the truth when I test them. You know what I tell them? I don't do what the white folks do. White folks don't even tell them why they tested them. So your kids don't take it seriously enough. Do y'all follow what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah. Dr. Umar said, listen here, Raheem. Are you <laughs> slow? <laughs> Because I'm not playing them. Oh, excuse me. You can fail. Fail. Fill me. Or your, is your ass slow? You got time for this? What, what, what is it? Listen, your mother told these white people. Your mother told these white people that you have a reading disability. And she wants you to get tested because she thinks you need to be in that classroom right over there. <laughs> the ones who come on the bus, damn straight. <laughs> I'm not riding no bus. Listen, son. Listen. Film me for a minute. I know you're not slow. You lazy and you spoiled and you trifling. I know this. I know this. I know your mother don't make you do homework, nor does she check it. I know this. Your father don't care about nothing but you going into the football division one because he never made it. I know this. But I'm going to make a deal with you, bro. Guess what? It's all up to you, Raheem. What are you talking about? What am I talking about? I gotta give you an IQ test to see how smart you are. I gotta give you an achievement battery to see how high your skills are. I'm gonna give you math, I'm gonna give you reading, I'm gonna give you reading comprehension, I'm gonna give you word decoding, I'm gonna give you listening comprehension, I'm gonna give you a psychological assessment to make sure your ass ain't been hanging no cats around Broward County. <laughs> <laughs> and, and listen, brother, it's all up to you. Once we've done this test, I'm gonna score these tests. Your scores determine if you go in special ed. Not your mother, not these white folks, not Dr. Umar. If you score high enough, you stay in the regular class. But if you score too low, you're going on the cheese bus, fam. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm telling you? <laughs> and then I get the test back, right? Take them down to the mom. And the principal was looking like, are you sure this is? Raheem, yes it is. But his teacher said he's below basic. You're telling me that this boy is actually advanced? How do you explain the difference between what he does in the class and what he did with you? I said, I gave the boy an offer he couldn't refuse. <laughs> <laughs> See, at home, they do what they want to do. In the class, they do what they want to do. But when they get in Dr. Umar's office and I tell them the truth, they do what they have to do. <laughs> Parents, what I need y'all to understand is there's no special ed in college. What I need you to understand, there's no special ed on the job. What I need you to understand, there's no special ed in trade school. There's no special ed in life. Why in the hell are black parents giving black children crutches with the belief that you'll be able to get over on white folks simply by telling them, 
you have a disability. You know why we got so many kids being referred for reading disabilities? Because they don't teach our kids how to read the way they taught us how to read. Now, I'm 40 years old. If you're 40 and over, you remember when you was in third and fourth grade. You remember that? And it was time to learn how to read. I remember fourth grade, I had Miss Mack. Fifth grade, I had Miss Robinson, my favorite teacher of all. And in sixth grade, I had Miss Lube, a white woman, but she was a damn good teacher. So when we got to fourth grade, Miss Mack, and fifth grade, Miss Robinson, and Miss Lube backed it up in sixth, and she introduced the comprehension on another level. And we would come into class on the first day of phonics. And Miss Mack would put a big A on the board. Y'all remember this? And then she said, classroom, repeat after me. A, 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 A. Yeah, you did that shit like a hundred times. A, A, A. Y'all remember that? The whole day was, hey, your throat was dry, strapped throat, no water, and then you came to class the next day. B. 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 You remember that? All day. Tonsillitis, everything. Next day, C. And then after she spent the whole month going through all of the four sounds of each letter, she would then come back and put the A next to the B. Mm. And now you had to do up, ab, up. Y'all remember that? And then she put the A next to the C. And you had to do ack, ack, ack. See, my 70s babies, y'all remember that, don't y'all? Okay? And by the time they was done teaching you, there wasn't a word they could write on that board. Mm -hmm. That word could be 30 letters long. But because they taught you with phonics, you could decode any word under the sun. Not your damn kids. Uh. They got something new out now. It's called whole language. They don't do phonics no more. They got whole, you know what whole language is? We gonna put the whole word on the board. <laughs> Sight word, not reading words, sight word, which means what? I'm going to teach you how to memorize the word elephant, but you don't know how to sound it out. Right. I'm going to teach you how to memorize the word encyclopedia, but you're not going to learn how to sound it out. And so you bragging about how my child got a strong sight word. Eyes only, no damn brains. Because he's memorizing and regurgitating words. But then when you give your baby a fresh passage to read, you're like, how can he read encyclopedia but can't read cat and dog? Because he's never been taught how to pronounce. And do you know why teachers don't teach phonics no more? Because phonics is labor intensive. It takes elbow grease. It takes effort, it takes push-up power, it takes sit-up strength to properly teach a child how to read. And the white teachers of Broward County got better things to do. I am giving you the facts, and they are undisputed. So if you want to prevent your child from ever being referred for a special ed evaluation, I suggest you turn off Monday Night Football and turn on Monday Night Phonics. <laughs> Parents, I had an email the other day, some of y'all might have saw me because I've been posting my messages lately that I get and I take everybody's names and information out because I want people to see how I spend most of my life helping parents. And so I had a mother who just transferred from the West Coast. Now she's down in North Carolina and the school wants to evaluate her child. The child was in special ed in California. Now they live in Charlotte. So I need y'all to know that because special ed is a federal law, it's national. If you move from Fort Lauderdale and move to Atlanta, Georgia, or move to Phoenix, Arizona, or move to Chicago, the IEP will move with your ass. Okay? We, if I get a kid from another state in my school with an IEP, I'm obligated to reevaluate the kid and create a new IEP for the new state. I cannot ignore the IEP unless you do something. Parents, did you know you have a right to stop special ed whenever you damn well please? Yes. Mm -hmm. What 
do you? Just what I said. If your kid is in special ed right now and you've had enough of it, all you have to do is call an IEP meeting Monday morning and say, I would like to exit my child from pre-incarceration services. <laughs> That's it. Every state has a form that you can sign releasing your child from academic bondage. That's it. So when you tell me that you're special ed and I don't know what to do, call an IEP meeting and get them out. That's it. Mm. But the problem is you keep on letting white folks bully you into doing what they want you to do. That's the problem. Well, did they make you go get them tested for ADHD? No, but they told me that if I didn't, I would have to come and sit next to my son every day. Well, first of all, there's no law that requires you to come sit next to your child every day. That's number one. Okay? Number two, we don't diagnose ADHD in the classroom. ADHD is not special ed. ADHD is not a special ed disability. ADHD is a mental disorder. You don't get that label in the school. None of you with an ADHD child got labeled in the classroom. You got labeled at the clinic, the hospital, private practice, but not in the school because ADHD is not special ed. But you can end up in special ed with the label. And I'm, you listen to the white folks, they tell you to go see We Hate Black People Psychological Associates. <laughs> so you take them on down to Dr. Uh, Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> he diagnoses your son with ADHD. But guess what? If you never told the school that Dr. Hitler diagnosed your son with ADHD, guess what? They could have never used it against them. The problem with you black parents, you talk too much. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes, you talk too much. Stop going to the public schools telling your business. Single black mothers, nobody needs to know you're a single black mother. Mm -hmm. right. What do you mean? What I mean is once they know you're a single black mother, your child is more likely to be suspended, more likely to be expelled, more likely to be held for detention, you're more likely to be ordered to sit with them in class, more likely for special ed, more likely for ADHD, because they know you're doing this by yourself and you ain't got no support. The worst thing a black mother could do is tell white folks I'm doing this by myself because they got you now. Let me give you an example to illustrate this point. You got a phone call from Mrs. Slurbanowski. <laughs> Shaquita's third grade teacher. So you go to see Miss Slurbanowski. She didn't call you three times in the same week. School just started August 21st. Right. Miss Slurbanowski says, oh, Shaquita. I'm so sorry. I know this is the third time. Oh, my God. It hurts to even have to make you come here. <laughs> Damn liars. It hurts. And then you start crying in front of the white girl, looking for sympathy. Did that ever work on a plantation? I didn't think so. But anyway, you start crying. You say, Miss Slurbanowski, I know my Shaquita got some behavior problems, but her father got locked up last year. She ain't been to see him. I can't take it because I'm working three jobs. My two other sons, their daddy just got locked up too. I ain't got no man in my life, no support. My mother was gracious enough to let me sleep in the basement with my three children. We in the basement, Miss Lebanowski. But I got some good news. I got a new job. I'm on probation, and if I make this probation 60 days, I'll be able to make enough money to get my sons out the ghetto. I can move from Lauderdale to Hollywood. <laughs> and if you work with me, Slurbanowski, I promise you, Sequita will get better. And then Miss Slurbanowski turned around because she saw you was looking for Negro sympathy and she played you like a sucker and she came back and said, Oh my God. <laughs> I had no idea our black mothers were under such duress. Shaquita, oh my God, I'm even crying now. Shaquita, listen, I know this is going to sound phony, but I'm a divorced mother and I'm raising my Robbie, my Tommy, and my Joel all along so I can fill you. But more than that, you, you 
are my hero. <laughs> Can we pray together? <laughs> you walk out the classroom, I got it. She on my side. Oh, yeah. Sucker. And guess what she do so when you leave the school after she plays your ass? <laughs> she go down to the principal, Dr. Silverberg. I got him. I got him. <laughs> Dr. Silverberg, I just had an emotional conversation with Shaquita, about Shaquita with her mother, mother same name Shaquita, she's probably drunk. But Dr. Silverberg, <laughs> Dr. Silverberg, I don't want to tell on her because I think she's really doing a good job to help us. But you know I'm a teacher, and I'm a mandated reporter, and my job comes first. And I really didn't want to come and tell you this. I feel a little guilty, but I'm obligated by my teacher's contract. She told me that she don't have a place to stay. She's living in her mother's basement, and I don't know what type of rodents are down there. Shaquita been coming to school with the same socks on. I noticed that her teeth haven't been brushed in about a month. Oh my God. And I don't want to tell you this, Dr. Silverberg, but... When I was talking to Shaquita, I gave her a hug because she looked like she was going to go into an emotional trance. She smelled like reefers. <laughs> you know what's going to happen two days later? Child Protective Services going to be banging on your damn door talking about we got an anonymous tip that there's some child neglect going on in your house. And now they telling you that you better put your daughter on that medicine or you're at risk of being charged with medical neglect and having your children taken from your home. Listen to me, black mothers, you better stop running around bragging in these public schools about how you're single because they're going to use it against you. Even if you ain't got a man, you better act like you do. I'm married. <laughs> And if they say, where your husband at? He's a truck driver. He sleeps in the day. <laughs> Damn it, tell him you got two husbands! <laughs> I'm serious. A black mother better never let nobody know you're doing it by yourself. Because once they know that, they know they got you. And do me another favor. Stop going to the school meetings by yourself. So, mm, yeah. You don't ever go into a gang war without a damn gang! Right. Oh, I guess I'm gonna run to this meeting real quick before I go to lunch. No, you ain't gonna do nothing real quick! Stop running to meetings without a plan of action! Know why you going and know what you went off the meeting. Well, Dr. Umar, I ain't got no strong black men in my family to go with me to the meeting. That's all right. Go to the corner and get Tay Tay and Papa. I'm serious. It works. It works. They telling you you got to put your son on some medicine for conduct disorder because they've been beating up all the kids in the school. You don't want to put your son on drugs. You know, little white kids been calling your son out of his name and he decided to clap back. We know that. Right. So, guess what you're going to do? You ain't got no brother, you got no uncle, baby daddy tripping on you, you got a white girl ran off. <laughs> so, guess what you're going to do? You're going to go to the court, you're going to get Tay Tay and Papa. That's right, with all the tattoos, wife beater, corn rolls, Tim's. Pants sagging, butt all out the whole night. Uh, and guess what? You're gonna show up in a meeting with Tay Tay. <laughs> serious? How much you wanna bet them white folks don't go there with you when they see Tay right. Tay? I've seen it done before. And you tell Tay Tay, right, right, listen. Just sit there, don't say nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Don't light a blunt, a cigarette, you're sick. <laughs> and check it out. But if you see them starting to gang up on me, bang your fist on the table. <laughs> Boom. Look them right in the eyes and say, I'm not feeling this. <laughs>
You got to bring the house from there today, but don't go by yourself. And black fathers, you better stop going alone. Sisters should take a man. Brothers should take a sister. Because most of the time, you're going to be dealing with white women. You need a sister there who can intervene and spank her in a nice, feminine way. Because you're going to come to buck on her. <laughs> and what's going to happen, she's going to tell your son need drugs. She's going to say, I'm not giving my son no drugs. Right. And she's going to say, I think you need to reconsider. And you're going to say, I already told you once, he ain't taking no medicine. And then she's going to say it again. And you're going to stand up like Tay Tay. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to say, I told your ass my son ain't taking <laughs> <laughs> And you know she's going to do? Yeah. She's going to go get Dr. Silverman. <laughs> and she's going to say, his vein protruded. And his eyes exuberated. And my back gave out. And my liver collapsed. And the next thing you know, you're going to be getting escorted out of handcuffs by the school police. And then you're going to get a restraining order in the mail talking about you are not allowed to come back to this school, not even for report cards of graduation. I know black men in America right now will not see their children graduate because a white woman lied on them. And they didn't listen to me. And they didn't have a sister there to intervene in the madness. Oh, that's crazy. We must go together. And there's something else I need y'all parents to embrace. Now, black people, we don't have a culture of working together. We don't. That's why we're dead last. Because we're the only non-white folks who ain't figured out yet that white folks ain't going to help you. Chinese, no white folks ain't going to help you. Arabs, no white folks ain't going to do shit. <laughs> Cut it out. Cut it out! Black people still think they go get some help from the same people that enslaved them. Right? So we don't have a culture working together. But I need y'all to stop working together. Parents, whenever you have an issue with your child, first thing you should do is not schedule a meeting. That's the second thing. The first thing you should do when you have an issue with your child is contact the other parents in your child's classroom to see if they have the same issue. Listen to me. Whenever you can bring another parent into the dynamic and say they're going through the same nonsense, it just became systematic racism, mm. not an individual case of discrimination. Mm. Are y'all following me? Yeah. That's what we got to start doing. Because the problem is, y'all fighting by yourself when all y'all going through the same mess. Brothers and sisters, we got the issue going on right now with Colin Kaepernick. Give him a hand, our brother Colin Kaepernick. Colin Kaepernick has showed you that you never know what you do out of respect for your people that can end up changing the world. I thank that brother because he sacrificed his whole career mm -hmm. to take a stand for us. Although I honor Colin Kaepernick, I have nothing but pity and contempt for Ray Lewis. Shaquille oh, yes, O'Neal, Little Wayne. Who else been Cody lately? Charles Barkley. Oh, God, when he shut the... Can somebody tell Charles Barkley not to speak again? I'm watching Undisputed with Skip and Shannon. And little Wheezy. Going to sit up there and say he never experienced racism. Okay. He getting paid to say that. What black man do you know in America? who has never experienced racism. The biggest white male imitator in history, and even he experienced racism. So you mean to tell me that you are a richly melanated brother from the ghetto of a southern state known as Louisiana, and you have never in your life experienced racism? It's a damn lie. Liar. You done made millions of dollars sexually objectifying black women. Millions of dollars reinforcing the stereotype of black men as violent. Millions of dollars promoting an image of an intoxicated black male. And you got the audacity to get on national television and not even speak up for the same people you've been exploiting. Shaquille O'Neal. My father was in the military. Although Colin Kaepernick had a right to protest, I didn't agree with the way he did it. So let me get this right. You the blackest thing on TNT. <laughs> Straight from Ugandan DNA. <laughs> and you got a damn nerve to sit up here and say, because your father was in the military, we don't have a right to protest for right. Get the hell out my face. But guess what, black folks? In case
case you ain't been keeping up with current events, your black athletes and entertainers are members of the black bourgeoisie. Yep. 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 See, they talk about how they keep it real when they ain't in front of white folks. <laughs> Their pants will sag, they will smoke weed, they will blend in and fit in, but the minute white folks call them to come and defend the system, hmm. They are always ready and willing to do so. Yep. This fight we got, the rappers will not be helping you anymore. No. And you know what hurts me about the NFL? These are the biggest, meanest, strongest, baddest black men on the planet. Right. But soon when it comes to challenging racism against their own people, they give up all that testosterone and swallow a pill full of estrogen. Yep. Wow. And this is what you want your son to become. Huh. Brothers and sisters, I need you to know that if you ever give your child or the school the right to evaluate your child for special ed, you can stop the evaluation in the middle of the process whenever you feel like it. Wait a minute. I just signed a paper last week. You mean I can turn that back? Yes. You are always in control. You are the parent. It's your show. You can write a letter Monday and say, I have reconsidered. Your request to have my Raheem evaluated. Mm -hmm. I am ordering you to cease and desist all psychological assessments at this time. I'm going to get my child a tutor because Dr. Umar Johnson told me <laughs> that the only thing half these black kids need in South Florida is a good tutor for a couple of weeks. And that will do a much better job working helping my son than your special ed ever would. If I decide to get it evaluated in the future, I will let you know. But until then, I would appreciate it if I do not receive any harassment from Miss Lerbinowski. <laughs> Yours truly, Second Met Ma'at Gennab Ra Kanoo Jackson. <laughs> yeah. Oh. See, you don't like it, but you got to love it because I tell you the truth. Ain't nobody's going to tell you this truth. They give you some truth, but they don't give you the whole truth. Right. Everybody in the conscious community got a little truth, but they, I'm going to give you the whole truth. See, they'll talk about white folks, but they won't talk about homosexuality. They'll talk about homosexuality, but they won't talk about the black bourgeoisie. Everybody got a limit. I ain't got no limits. I'm gonna if it's wrong, I'm going to talk about it. See, I, when I resigned from the school district of Philadelphia 11 years ago, my colleagues thought I was crazy. They said, this Negro is walking away from one of the highest paychecks in Philadelphia. Because in Philadelphia, the school psychologists get paid like principals. But you only do half the work. And in five years, you are at maximum salary. So when I said I'm quitting, they said, Negroes, you crazy. <laughs> but I, thank God I made the right decision because I've been free ever since. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, I need you to know that if your child is evaluated and you don't agree with the evaluation, you got a right to an independent educational evaluation. Did you hear that? Wait a minute, Doc. Are you telling me if they say my son got a disability and I don't agree with it, I can write a letter to the principal asking for an independent eval and I choose my own psychologist and the school district has to pay the bill? That's the law. Wow. And you know I know the law because I'm that dude in Pennsylvania. When a black parent don't agree with the eval, the white folks call me before the parent even called in. They say, we know they want to call you, sir. <laughs> so just come get the damn check. We're so tired of this shit. Who do you think he is? <laughs> Brothers and sisters, let's talk about the laws of racism for a minute. Yeah, let's do it. There's three laws of racism I need y'all to understand. All my children in the house, my babies, my high schoolers, my middle schoolers, I need y'all to understand this too. There's three laws of racism that black folk need to understand as we move forward into this 21st century. Because y'all do know, on August 21st of 2019, only two years, we will be celebrating 400 years since slavery began in North America under the British. You've been under the foot of white supremacy for four centuries and you still don't even understand it. So I'm here today to clear up the air and make sure you understand white supremacy once and for all. What's the first law of white supremacy? 
If you don't understand the first law, ain't no need for me to talk about the second and the third one. And the first law of white supremacy is all white people. Every last one of them. The young ones and the old ones, the Irish and the Italians, the Anglo-Saxons and the Greeks, European Jews and Romans, Uzbekistan, Kabakistan, <laughs> are racist. All white people are racist. And until black people understand that all white people are racist, you're going to continue to be a victim of racism. Now, we got some white guests in the audience, and that's all right, because I want them to learn this too. They need to learn about themselves. But <laughs> listen, listen. <laughs> when I say all white people are racist, many of you feel shocked. <laughs> Because we've been raised in church with a white Jesus that you kneel to and pray to and pour your heart out so subconsciously. It's hard for you to accept that all white people are racist when your Lord and Savior happens to be one. Now, I'm not talking to my Christian brothers and sisters who got a white, excuse me, a black Jesus in their church. You are exempt from this. Because your Christ looks like you. You are right with me, fam. I'm talking about the ones who still got a Caucasian Jesus in their church. And when I say all white people are racist, I didn't say all white people hate black people. Right. There's a difference. I'm going to break it on that. You don't have to hate black people to be a racist. Mm -hmm. Let me say it again. Some of the best racists love you. <laughs> Hillary Clinton is an excellent example of a white supremacist who loves black people. Bill Clinton is an excellent example of a white supremacist who loves black folks. You think they gotta hate you to be racist. Nope. You ain't got to hate black people to be racist because racism is not about hate. Racism is not about bigotry. Racism is not about a desire to see all black people removed from the earth. You got a lot of white folks who do, but you don't have to be a racist to hate black people. Racism is only about two things. And neither one is hate and emotion. Racism is about power and privilege. That's it. All white people on the planet desire to protect the power and privilege that they benefit from vis-a-vis -vis your oppression. There has never been a white person on this planet and there never will be a white person on this planet who has ever fought to eliminate white privilege. If you know one, please call their name. You've had white people fought to end slavery. You have white people fought to change the laws in the prisons. You have white people fought to end hunger in Africa. You got white people fought to help black people get jobs. You have white people fought to make the schools better. They dealt with the symptoms, never the causes. Yes. And believe it or not, I can have a lot of excellent conversations with white folks. You know why? Because they understand something right up front. I don't want to sleep with your daughter. I don't want to live on your block. And I don't want to go to your church. They don't like my pride in being African. But they can tolerate me better than an integrationist. You want to marry his daughter. You want to live on his block. You want to go to his church. You want to eat at his Starbucks. We got gentrification in the inner city. Let me tell you why they didn't gentrify in Detroit, gentrify in Chicago. They didn't already gentrify Harlem, gentrifying DC. They're about to gentrify Baltimore. I live in Philly. They damn near completed the inner city ethnic cleansing of Negroes in Philadelphia. They're doing it in Miami right now. Yeah. Yeah. Fort Lauderdale, too. And this is why I can't stand black politicians. Because real estate decisions are made 10 to 20 years before they happen. 
That means our black politicians and preachers knew the white folks were going to take back the ghetto and didn't even give us a warning that they would do it. But let me tell you why they're doing it. White people did not leave the inner cities of Fort Lauderdale and Miami and Detroit, Chicago. They didn't leave because they wanted to. They left because during the Great Migration, you came north. And even those of you who live in the south, you came to the city centers to find work. And in coming to the city centers, white folks decided to do what? Run to the suburbs. Because all white people have a burden to always look like you're better than black folks. And in order to upkeep the white burden, you cannot have too many black people living around you because that makes them equal to you. That's why they have a two black family rule. Once two black families move on the block, we got to get the hell up because you're eating away at white privilege. Privilege means you shouldn't even be able to afford to live on this block. Privilege is you shouldn't be able to afford this real estate taxes. Y'all know what I'm talking about. So once you get more than two black families, they move. So they never intended to move to the suburbs forever. Uh-uh. They like living right where they was in Fort Lauderdale, but they had to get away from you. But then something happened. When the white folks ran to the suburbs, you follow. the niggers ran after them. <laughs> That's you. So then the white folks said, let's move out to the greater supper. And the nigger said, I'm right behind you, Max. So then the white folks said, we ran out of places to hide. So then they got with the government and said, if the nigger is going to chase us everywhere we go, why not set them up? Let's lure all of them out here to the suburbs. And then let's get with the Federal Housing Authority, Section 8 and HUD, and let's let all the low-income parents get a Section 8 house in the suburbs where they could never, ever live before. They're going to be so happy, bouncing with joy. And then we're going to go back to the ghetto the minute they leave it and buy up all the abandoned houses, properties, corner stores, lots, and raise the property value up so high that by the time they realize all we did was a bait and switch, it'll be too late to get back to the cat. See, let me explain something to y'all. In Philadelphia, it's very inconvenient to get to an Eagles game from the suburbs. In Miami with that traffic, it's very inconvenient to get to a Miami Heat game from the suburbs. You ever see the white folks? Mad as hell, sitting in that lawn looking at you while you on public transportation. <laughs> and guess what they doing to help get rid of black folks for Lauderdale? They using charter schools to do it. Yeah. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. charter schools ain't your friend. Nope. Charter schools is helping the white folks clean you on out. Yeah. Have you noticed? You only find charter schools in low-income and working-class neighborhoods? Have you noticed you've never seen a single charter school in a white, rich suburb? Why aren't charter schools in the suburbs? Why are they only in black neighborhoods? Because the charter schools were designed to clean you out. Let me show you how they do it. So let's say there's a certain section of Miami we want to take back. But it's concentrated number of blacks. Haitians, Nigeria, it's like the United Nations. <laughs> Every black you can find is there. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to take out a charter school application, and we're going to buy a building in the middle of all these black folks we're going to get rid of. We hate black people charter school. And we're going to get a black person to go around to all the black people in Miami and tell them, this is for your children. Hmm. An opportunity for better education. Now, mind you, once we get approved for the charter, 99% of all the teachers and staff that we hire are going to be white folks. Yeah. And they're going to come into Miami and buy houses, businesses, corner stores, abandoned buildings, and the black people aren't going to say a word because, after all, 
that's my son's teacher. And I don't see anything wrong with the teacher living on the same block with the kids they teach. But what you fail to realize is the charter school and the charter school's teachers are in collaboration with the city manager to get you up out. And guess what happens once all those white folks move into that section of Miami? What happens to the property value? And what happens to the property tax? And before you know it, Shea Butter Academy. <laughs> Ten years later, it's Christopher Columbus Academy. The whole damn neighborhood is white, and you sitting there pulling your hair out. I thought that was for me. That was a setup for a setback. <laughs> charter schools are not your friend. Now, am I demonizing the black charters? No. We got some black people with charter schools who are doing a good job, and we support them. But the charter schools as a movement was never to help us. You know where we went wrong? Do y'all remember in the 1980s, we were fighting for community control of the public schools? Y'all remember that? We wasn't talking about no damn charter school. We said we want to own and run the schools that our kids go to. Before you hire that principal, you better get our permission. Before you hire that superintendent, you better get our permission. Before any of those teachers come into the school, they got to sit down and be interviewed by the parents, and we have the final say on whether they get the job. Y'all remember that? But the problem is, Greedy Negroes got bought out. The white man showed up in 1990 with a charter school application, and he said, listen, why do you need to have community control? We have a new kind of school where we want to give you the money for every child that goes there. They will get the money from the school district, so you don't need no grants. You ain't got to do what Umar Johnson is doing, that Frederick Douglass stuff. You will be subsidized. And guess what? You can write yourself into the budget. You don't know nothing about running no school. You're not a principal, but you can call yourself the CEO and hire another principal to do all the work and still pay yourself $100,000 a year for doing absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. And once Negroes found out they can write themselves into the budget, we gave up community control and started running for charter schools. And now everybody asking me why I don't want a damn charter school. Are you out of your mind? The charter school is an alternative public school. You don't own that. The state owns that. Two years ago, we saw more black charter schools get shut down across this country than any year since they started in 1990. And what are the same three excuses they keep on using to get rid of black charter schools? Excuse number one. You don't have enough certified teachers. Excuse number two, there's 25 cents missing from your $5 million budget. <laughs> Excuse number three, your children's test scores are so low. We gave you two years of corrective action to get them to proficient, and 95% of your kids that we hate black people charter are below basic. So unfortunately, we're going to take your charter and give it to a white person and they're going to come in and they're going to reorganize your black charter school. Ain't nothing but a damn takeover. Okay. Brothers and sisters, Umar Johnson don't want no charter school. The charter school's got to have special ed. And charter school's got to have enough white folks in it. Don't get me wrong. I'm going to have two white folks. <laughs> <laughs> two. two. If any of y'all know some real good white folks, I need two of them. <laughs> one male and one female. Rebecca Samuels <laughs> and Thomas Gray. <laughs> and why am I going to have two white teachers? Because if I ain't got no white teachers, they're going to say I'm systematically discriminating. Even though it's a private school, you cannot practice, you know, discrimination. So I need to have two white folks. And every time we got to talk to the media, they're going to talk for me. <laughs> you think I'm playing? Yeah. Rebecca, she's going to have lots of shit, shea butter. <laughs> Thomas going to have Tim's and a white. <laughs> Gotta have two white folks, because when we coming back from a football game, 
You want to make sure the tires don't get flat. And if Thomas is on the bus, the tires ain't going to get flat. You got to be strategic. Right. If I ain't got no white coach on my football team, white and sophisticated coach, he might just, you know, put air in the footballs. But I got to have him on that sideline so we don't get cheated in the playoffs. Do y'all understand me? Yeah. You got to be, white folks use you all the time. Right. You in a damn Chinese store. And they got you baking them dirty wings. <laughs> so we can shop and buy. And y'all better stop eating them wings. Right. They don't ever get no new wings. It's always the same wings <laughs> with the same grease. And have you ever seen notice how the wings from the Chinese store don't even look like chicken wings? <laughs> Do that. They look like fingers. <laughs> you eat flesh wings. What the? <laughs> so brothers and sisters, if you were to work at Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey, send me your resume. We received over 5,000 already. I need 5,000 more because it ain't going to be just one school. We're going to end up with 50 of them. Even if the first school ain't in South Florida, the second one might be, the third one might be, the fourth one might be. I need a school district. I don't just want to be the principal. I want to be the superintendent. So send me your resume. Now you can email it to F. D-M-G, resumes with an S. I repeat, F-D-M-G, R-E-S-U-M-E-S, at gmail.com. I need coaches, I need teachers, I need agriculturalists, I need hairstylists. That's natural hair, by the way. Amen. Because in my academy for the girls, there will be no weaves, no perms, no straightening combs, no S-curls, no jerry curls, no relaxer whatsoever, no hair color, unless it's natural. Good God Almighty, I feel the ghost in me. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, it will be a happy to be nappy institution, my Lord. Good, good, good. Yes, we will be happy to be happy. And I see some of my feminists, what the hell is he telling me how to wear my daughter's hair? You know why, feminists? Because before I can teach your daughter math, history, culture, science, I gotta teach her to look in the mirror and love what the hell she sees. That's the first job I got. I'm raising queens, not hood rats. What the hell wrong with you? I'm raising queens, damn it. And I'm not going to apologize for how I want to do it. So stand with me or get ye behind me, Satan. <laughs> she can have locks. She can have a Caesar, a blowout, a head wrap, a shape but a special, whatever she <laughs> But it better be hers. I know, that's the truth. <laughs> picking on my sisters who are not natural. I love all black women. You was raised in a certain generation, sisters. I don't blame you at all. You grew up at a time where we thought looking white made us all right. Mm. But brother, I want you to encourage your sister who not natural to go there. Right. Because black men, we cannot laugh at the sisters who processed. You know why? Because why do you think her head is processed in the first place? She looking like that, which she has seen, you are attracted to. The black man is to blame for the black woman being processed. If these sisters in Broward and Dade County knew that none of the brothers would date a sister unless she natural, they'd be natural tomorrow. You damn right. She could care less about that week if she got an alpha male to come home to. Right. An alpha. Yeah. Not a beta. <laughs> you gotta watch the beta male system. Eyelashes longer than yours. I had one brother came up to me, lips all glossy, poked out, talking about I need a ticket, not to my damn lecture. <laughs> Skinny jeans all tight, camel toe, that's nasty! <laughs> nasty! <laughs> Y'all 
damn shame. But listen, sisters, brothers, before you make your queen go natural, there's something you got to do before she declares her God-given inheritance to a healthy African scout. You have to undergo a scalp check. Because some sisters have scalp trauma. Quiet as hell in here. That's right. Some sisters mad. See, some sisters, skin burn, patches, tracks. It's a damn war zone under that wheel. So, brother, if you love your queen and she got scalp damage, you got to say, baby, we in this from the cradle to the grave. <laughs> you pull off that weed and you get you some hot strawberry shea butter. If she don't like shea, get almond butter. If she don't like almond, get some hot cocoa butter. Put a little honey in it. And you massage her scalp every night. Rub that ball in that head. Rub that Fix that scalp damage. <laughs> yeah, start growing. It needs love. It needs love. I'm serious because a lot of sisters like I want to go natural, but that shit ain't right over here. <laughs> love, love. That's all right, sister, because you can head wrap that, get you a nice little tap scarf made in China, and wrap it on up for a few weeks until the new growth come over. We're going to get everybody natural. But if you're going to apply to my school, there's two rules. I don't want your resume unless you can confirm, and I will be investigating. You cannot be sexually confused. I know that's the thing. Yeah, yeah. I do not hate you. You heard that? I do not dislike you. I love all my African sisters, gay or straight. I love all my African brothers, gay or straight. But in order for us to fix this, right. we got to do it a certain way. Right. So I respect your right to do what you want to do under your roof. But under that banner of FDMG with that picture of Douglas and Garvey, I refuse. In the second rule, you cannot absolutely be dating sleeping with, cohabitating, engaged, or married to an alien. And by the way, when I say alien, that means all non-African people. I'm not calling them space aliens, I'm using alien politically speaking, like an illegal alien. There will be no illegal aliens in my damn school. I will have an office of Garvey integration. And I will seize you up out of that academy. <laughs> so sisters and brothers, come correct. Now, sister, if you ain't natural now, submit your resume because you got a year full of new growth. <laughs> I feel the Holy Ghost in heaven, my good God. You got a year to let your man rub that scalp and kiss and shake butter coffee butter. <laughs> what I can't wait till the school open. I need some natural hair. I need some chefs. We're going to teach the children how to uh, make their own raw food. Every Friday, we're going to have a, we're going to have a, a green smoothie Friday where all the children are going to make their own green smoothies and give them out to the elders in the community. I'll be good. I got like a million programs, but I can't let y'all know them all because some of y'all are going to steal my shit. <laughs> But if you want to work there, and you're not, and you're willing to commute in case the first one ain't in South Florida, it's really looking likely that Detroit might be it. Now, if you can live in the cold without no trauma, come on up to Detroit, because it is the blackest city in America. But you guys ain't far behind. I didn't know that until I came. Broward and Dade, y'all, y'all, y'all up there. Y'all up there. Do y'all got the consciousness to go with it? Y'all working on it. Keep working. I know it can be hard under the sun. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, the second rule of racism. The first rule is all white folks is racist. The second rule of racism. 
white people do not share power with black people. Did y'all hear what I just said? Because some of y'all Negroes in Fort Lauderdale see them new signs I saw downtown. A new Fort Lauderdale. <laughs> And y'all Negroes really think these white folks is building up all these new buildings. They're sharing with you. Hmm. Let me give you a little secret. Whenever you live in the hood and they build a Starbucks, that means you're on your way out. <laughs> Whenever you live in the ghetto and they got a big Walmart superstore, that is not for you. <laughs> when you would shoot them up Central and they build a brand new 14 cinema theater, you get the best belief that is not yours. <laughs> you know what bothers me, y'all? Last year, black America spent $2 billion on Air Jordans and $4 billion on liquor and alcohol and $600 million on McDonald's and fast food and black women, $9 billion on hair care products. <laughs> But I blame the brothers for that statistic. Last year, black people bought twice the Mercedes Benzes of Europeans, but you only have a third of their wealth. What is it about the Mercedes Benz that whole tempers are going crazy for that European car? It's a status symbol. You think it makes you look more important than other black folks. I'm not demonize you if you got a Mercedes. I just came back from China speaking to the Africans in China for the first time. China is buck wild with bootlegging. <laughs> they took me to a mall, the whole damn mall is bootleg products. <laughs> and unlike in America where you got to sell them out your trunk, uh-uh, they sell them in the open. <laughs> they had true religion jeans, every color, every stitch. $20 a piece? I said, give me one of every one. <laughs> but we had one problem. Chinese people are small. And the biggest waste they had it was a 36! I said, I'm a 42! You know what that Chinese midget told me? <laughs> you should lose weight. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. They invited me back to China in January, so I'm about to get on my Billy Blanks tie and I'm going to get down to 36. <laughs> and I'm going to get every stitch of every fake true religion they got. <laughs> but you know what was so sad about China and Japan? So many of my brothers out there, they was good brothers. But guess who they was married to, ladies? And one of the sisters stood up at the conference. We are in Shanghai, I believe, or Beijing, one or the other. We went to both of them. And the sister got up, she almost cried. She said, Dr. Umar, we in China. It ain't that many of us. Can you please explain to me why every black man who came out here to hear you tonight? She said they came with their dashikis. They red, black, and green wristbands. She exposed their asses. That was a strong sister. She said, all these brothers who here to see you married the Chinese women. In Japan, it was no, black women can't even get a man in China. That's how bad it is, y'all. And our sisters are hurting from it. We got to make a change. The third rule of racism is white supremacy is ruthless. If I got to create AIDS to infect every heterosexual black female between the ages of 38 and 58 to the point that it becomes their leading cause of death, I'm going to do it. If I got to inject little black boys with a, a tetanus virus shot that I know triggers autism, I'ma do it. If I gotta give black women a birth control device, Noraplant, and put it in her arm so it can control the hormones, but I don't tell her, it's also gonna lead to ovarian and breast cancer, I'ma do it. If I gotta create Ebola in West Nile to wipe the Negroes out, I'ma 
do it. White supremacy is ruthless. We got to understand what we up against. We do not have to be them to beat them, but we must understand them. Brothers and sisters, we are in a very difficult time now. Eight years of Barack Obama put us back almost 800. And it is not Obama's fault per se as much as it is yours. Because to his credit, he never said he was going to do a damn thing right. for black folks. But it was all you white Jesus freaks <laughs> who projected onto this man a messianic complex right. that he did not have the courage or interest in fulfilling. Mm. Sat back and let white supremacy reorganize, revitalize, and re-energize. And white folks studied Negroes under Obama and they said, you notice they ain't really do nothing when we did this. They ain't really do nothing when we did this. See, that first one, Trayvon, South Florida. And you know, I was here when that verdict came out. I was right here. I was interviewed in Miami a day before. A brother said, Dr. Humo, what do you think the verdict gonna be? I said, Zimmerman is walking. I promise you, it's on YouTube. Now, I want you to watch everything up on YouTube, but that's on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> and Zimmerman walked, and people said, how did you know? I said, first of all, history. Not only that, whenever you're dealing with power, power would do whatever power wants to do unless another power stops it. And when Obama got elected, black people saw that as a victory, and we start talking about this post-racial America that we live in. And because we created a post-racial, non-racial climate, it made it real easy for George Zimmerman's attorney to argue that race had nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. George Zimmerman should have been tried with a hate crime, federal law. Yeah. All these police killing off our young men and women, Sandra Bland, Philando Castile, Alton Sterling, <laughs> Freddie Gray, Tamir Rice, and the list goes on and on. Federal hate crimes, but not a single one has been charged as such because you said race no longer matters. Mm. And I'm here to tell you tonight, South Florida, that race still and always forever will matter. Yes. And I'm also here to let you know that until you recognize the central importance of race in your struggle, we will never overcome it. Because the white man ain't interested in being nothing but a white man. And the Chinese ain't interested in being nothing but a Chinese. Yep. He loves his race so much and can't stand you so much <laughs> that even when he has a job opening in one of them stores, he puts the help wanted sign in Chinese to make sure your black ass don't fly. <laughs> See, there's something the Arabs got, and it's something the East Indians got, and it's something the Jews got, and it's something the Anglo-Saxons got, and it's something the Mexicans got that slavery stole from us. <laughs> and that's the collective commitment to the cultural creativity. Yeah, yeah. You can put five Chinese on the same block. They don't even know each other. They don't even know each other. Within a week, they would have already started a Chinese-American business association. Within a month, they will already have at least one business. Within six months, they will pretty much run the economy of the black community. South Florida, and I'm going to be wrapping up in the next 15 minutes, there's something I see wherever I go in the world, and it hurts me. Because as you know, I'm more traveled than any other scholar on the planet of our race. And so I've been just about everywhere. And everywhere I go, there's three constants. Wherever I go, I don't care if I'm in London. I don't care if I'm in Toronto. I don't care if I'm in Jamaica. I just got back from Cuba. I don't care if I'm in South Africa, South America. Wherever I go, and black people are there, there's three things I'm going to see. The first of them is a white Jesus. I don't care where you at. You are in love with a cracker crack. <laughs> See, I'm going to keep it real. There's two Christs 
in the black community. And my question today, which one are you worshiping? See, there's Jesus Christ and there's Jesus Cracker. Now, let me help you in case you don't know which one you worship. And I'm going to make this real. Jesus Christ was a blue, black, purple African born in a cave in Ethiopia. Jesus Cracker is a white man born in a manger in Bethlehem. Jesus Christ had nappy hair and feet like burnt brass. It says so in your Bible even today. Yep. Jesus Cracker looked like Michael Bowen or Lionel Richie. <laughs> Jesus Christ was hung by a tree by white people mm. protesting injustice against his own. Jesus Cracker was sacrificed on a cross. Which one do you pray to? Because you cannot let your children grow up looking at the image of God as the image of the oppressor because the brain is a very powerful instrument. And whatever goes into the brain can never be taken out. I want to say that one more time. This is the psychologist in me, because y'all don't get it when we talk about raising our babies right. Whatever you put in the mind stays forever. And if a little black boy or girl goes to church in South Florida looking at a white Jesus, I'm not talking about your religion, nothing wrong with Christianity, I'm talking about the images. If God has been white since I was a child, then my brain will automatically assume that all white people are godly. That's right. So it's okay for the president to be white because God is. It's okay for the Supreme Court justice to be white. God is. It's okay for white people to own all the businesses because God is white. I'm telling you that raising a black child under a white Jesus is teaching him to submit to white male authority. That's right. mm. Don't tell me public school taught your child how to hate himself. I totally disagree. It was a black Sunday school that did it. Mm. Brothers and sisters, I want to talk about Willie Lynch for a moment. Can I do that? Yeah. Willie Lynch! <laughs> Willie Lynch. And first of all, because I know we got some old teppers in here. <laughs> I don't care if Willie Lynch existed or not. I don't care if the letter was fabricated or not. I'm only concerned with the scientific underpinning of the letter. If you are a Christian, you know that everything written in the Bible, most of it was parable. It was fantasy and imagination, but it was the purpose. Allegorical. Control that. Christ, right? Control. <laughs> the purpose of the parable is to do what? Teach a profound spiritual truth. So I don't care if the Bible wasn't 100% accurate. I don't care if the Willie Lynch letter was 100% accurate. The truth of the message that the story was trying to impart was totally true. Mm -hmm. Now, Lynch taught a lot, but for the purpose of time, I'm going to give you three principles. Principle number one. Willie Lynch said if you want to control your Negroes, one of the first things you have to do is stop allowing them to speak their native tongue. Right. Willie Lynch said that if you want to control black people, make sure they only communicate through the king's English. But guess what, black folks? The American slave owners didn't listen. No. They said it was illegal for you to learn how to read or write. They said if we ever catch you reading, we want to take off one of the digits of your finger. And this is why when you see a lot of pictures of enslaved Africans, they're missing one finger, two finger. Most of y'all think they're missing the fingers because they accidentally cut them off when they were working. Uh -uh. Those fingers were deliberately, deliberately cut off because that was the punishment. Every time they caught you with a book, you lose one. Every time they caught you with a pencil, you lose one. Catch you reading, you lose one. So if you got caught ten times, <laughs> you never carry another book or write with another pencil. And guess what? Because they didn't let you learn the King's English, do you know what they did by contraindication? They help you preserve your own African tongue. 
Which means that all the way to 2017, today, right now, September 30th, every last one of you in this audience, you don't speak English. You speak Ebonics. You speak an African dialect that your ancestors brought over here when they brought us here that you have never stopped speaking because the white man never fully destroyed it. You don't speak broken English. You speak an African language. The only thing you borrow from your oppressor is his vocabulary. Now, some of you would argue, if I'm using a white man's vocab, then I'm speaking a white man's language. Be careful. Because 40% of the American vernacular does not come from Europe. So if you're telling me you're speaking English because you're using white people's words, what is the white man speaking because half his words are not from white people? Now let me go a little bit deeper because I know I've got some bougie Negroes in here saying, I cannot believe he's saying this. <laughs> See, the reason bourgeois Negroes need you to speak perfect English because they're ashamed and insecure of being black in the first place. Okay? And they need you to carbon copy their oppressor so they can feel at peace. Well, I'm telling you right now, I can walk into a room full of white folks with my flip-flops on, eating hot dogs and beans out of a damn pan with a plastic fork, and I won't feel insecure because I don't need validation from I'm oppressed to be who I am. So brothers and sisters, let me go a little deeper with this language thing. I'm going to give you three differences between African language and white language. I don't care if you in Nigeria, Liberia, Ghana, Jamaica, Cuba, Haiti, Ethiopia, Senegal, Fort Lauderdale, or Miami. There's certain ways black people talk no matter what language we speak. It's universal. And it differs from the way white people talk. I'm going to give you the first. When black people talk, excuse me, when white people talk, we just have strong consonant endings on the words. White people will say, we are getting ready to go have supper with the silver styles. <laughs> To speak like perfect English, sure. you have to enunciate the ending sound, the last syllable of every word. Really? When white people talk, it's break, pronunciate, break, pronunciate, break, constant interruptions. That is not how black people language is. Go to any African country on the planet and there is no breaks. And rarely do you find strong consonant endings on our words. Look at your name. Mo Rashida. Most of the names have a vowel on the end, not a consonant. Tamika, Shaquita, Rashida, Matita. <laughs> now, when black people talk, we don't say we're going to get supper with the top sons. Yes, we speak more articulately than that. We say, I'm fixing to get sunny. You see how articulate that was? <laughs> now, what was the difference between our vernacular? Our words run together without interruption. We talk in a rhythm and a flow that represents the cosmic circular circumference of African reality. Our language is a manifestation of ourselves. We are not white folks. Let me give you a second difference between black sound and white sound. When white people talk, they value communication of the message intended by the words. So after white people talk, they will say, did you understand me? Did you hear me? Is this at all unclear? Right? They want to make sure you understood what they said, not us. Black people, we don't give a damn about what you said or how you said it. The only thing I give a damn about is what you really meant by what you said. So for black folk, it ain't the message, it's the vibration behind it. Are y'all following me? 
So sister, you go to work one day, and you got the ugliest dress in the world on. And your girlfriend come over to her, she said, baby, that's a fine ass dress. He said, excuse me, she said, that dress is the bomb. And you ignore her. And she says, did you hear me? I gave you a compliment. He said, I heard what you said, but what you really meant is you don't know why the hell I came out my house with this dress on today. Are y'all following me? See, we are a vibrational people. You can talk to us without saying a word. And that's how you can walk in this room today. And you can just feel the energy, whether it's positive or negative. A sister could walk in that room with her man, and she could feel how many other thirsty queens is checking out. Right? Right? And she got vibes coming in from every way. Right? Panty energy just coming different ways, and she don't know where it's coming from. Because it's the vibration. Brothers know what I'm talking about. You can have a brother come up to you and give you a strong compliment. But before he came to you, his energy already told you he was a hater. You feel me? Because for black people, we don't care what you meant. It's all about, do I feel you? And do you feel me? And this is one of the reasons why being around white folks is toxic to African mental and spiritual health. Because you are a truthful people. We don't even know how to lie. That's why we always get caught when we do. <laughs> of divine truth. You can't. And when you sue the white folks and you go to court and you tell the judge, I got fired because I was black, not because I was late. And the judge says, where's your proof? And it hurts you inside because you know you're right. And the only proof you got is the vibration that that white racist boss been sending you since you've been working there. But unfortunately, in white culture, they do not value a truth that cannot be seen, tasted, measured, exploited, or sold for profit. And guess what else, black people? You better stop letting these white colleges teach you how to tune off your intuition. See, a big difference between African culture and European culture, they believe that the brain and the mind and intellectual analysis are superior. We do not. In our culture, we believe that although God great us, gave us a very sophisticated gift in the human brain, there's something greater than consciousness, and that is spiritual reality. And that's why I always tell black mothers that when you go to these school meetings and something in your stomach, say, this ain't right. My boy, I don't think my boy got this problem. Follow your gut. That's God talking to you right there. Yeah. I'm going to give you one more and then I'm going to give my closing words and then we're going to sign books and take pictures and make sure you do purchase something from my table. I got some unapologetically African t-shirts. If you're dating white, just go on past those. <laughs> but you can still buy the book because the child is black. I got the FDMG pillows in the back. They're $50 a pop, handmade. Don't make love on them, they for decorations. <laughs> I got my DVDs and CDs, and I got some Marcus Garvey RBG flags in the back, not made in China, but the real ones. <laughs> and I got some t-shirts with Dr. Papa, yours truly, on the front. So whatever you can spend, because I'm using the money from these sales to continue to finance my travels around the country investigating these schools. Because the money that you donate to FDMG, I do not touch it. Contrary to the haters, there have never been a withdrawal from that money. Since we opened the account back in 2014, not a single bill, not a single check has been written from that account. In fact, last year, the whole tempers called GoFundMe. And they told GoFundMe that I was spending the school money, so GoFundMe froze my account for one day. Some of y'all might remember this. And they said, we need evidence because I have black people calling us, your people, <laughs> saying that I'm black. They wanted to make sure that I knew it was mine, not theirs. <laughs> saying that you're spending the school money, so I gave them all the information to the bank account. And I said, call the bank and ask them. I already gave the bank permission. Call the bank and ask them. Has there ever been a withdrawal bill, any activity other than deposits on this account? So they investigated and they restored the account. I am not a thief. 
My goal is more than money, and that's to see my people free. That's what the hell I'm working for. But I want to give you a third difference, brothers and sisters, between white language and black language, and I will end on that. White people believe that only one person should talk at a time. <laughs> right? Miss Lerbanowski with her breath, she wants to sit there all day. I'm telling you I need some meds. <laughs> And white people believe nobody else should talk until that person is done. But we are not a vertical people, we horizontal. So in black culture, you are expected to participate in my conversation. In fact, if you don't, it could be a form of disrespect. We often talk to each other hoping you will give me the word to say what I feel. <laughs> and so, when black people talk, if you jump in and cut me off and finish my sentence, that is a validation that you are on the same vibration. Are y'all following me today, South Florida? Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about, black woman. You at the bus stop. You got written up at your job. Racist white woman with no shape, jealous of your bounce in your heels, right? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Flatty patty can't stand you. <laughs> so you get to the bus stop, you see another sister there, you don't even know this sister, but guess what? Same thing happened to her with her job at another place. And you sit there and you say, sister, I know I don't know you, but I just need to talk to, to you about what happened to me today. I'm at my job, and this racist white woman comes over me, and then she cuts you off, and then she tells you you're in trouble for doing something wrong, because she got a flatty pain, and you pull up, yeah, girl, do you feel me? <laughs> That's black people, baby. Well, stop trying to be white, because we not them. Do you realize we was on the planet two million years by ourselves? before anybody else came. I need you to know that that cell phone in your pocket, we invented that. Yeah. And I need you to know that that Hummer truck you be driving, we invented that. And I need you to know that that internet you be surfing, we invented that. And I need you to know that when you leave here today and get in your car and you turn on that car and you put it in gear, that manual transmission and the automatic transmission Invented by blacks and guess what when you go over those bumps on them tour bad streets of Miami Gardens and you bump It's a black person who designed them shocks to make sure you can go over them bumps a little bit better And that engine that you got that you only got to get the oil changed once every three months You know who made that possible a black man by the name of Elijah McCoy who came up with the self-lubricating engine So you can drive for months without an oil change. That's black folks, baby The helicopters you see flying over your housing projects Black folks invented the helicopter. White folks came up with the airplane, but the airplane has to move. Helicopter can stay in the air, stationary. That was us. And when we look at these lights right now, they can stay on like this without blinking a million times because a black man by the name of Lewis Latimer wrote a textbook that taught the United States government how you can light up a whole city at night. And guess what? He was so brilliant that the Chinese invited him to China. And this black man, Louis Latimer, went to China and taught the Chinese how to light up China. And then Canada said, we need your help. And he went to Canada and taught Canada how to light up a white country. And then England called for him. You don't know it. But when you go to sleep at night and them lights is on, you can thank a black man for why the world can still stay lit in the dark. integrate public school to give our children a better education. They integrated public school because the black child was inventing things that the white child wasn't even thinking about and you were doing sitting next to a white kid. You coming up with gas masks and stoplights and three-way lights and electronic transmitters and walkie-talkies in a one-room, dilapidated, underfunded schoolhouse. And here's something I want to tell my parents. 
Even if you can't afford to send your child to a white private school, you better think twice. Because I don't care how beautiful the school looks. I don't care how educated the teachers are. I don't care how advanced you consider the curriculum to be. At the end of the day, if it ain't no love in that school, if it ain't no commitment in that school, if it ain't no concern in that school for your baby, the baby will not learn because love is the oxygen through which a baby grows academically. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, they integrated the schools so they could supervise the intellectual superiority of black children. Oh, yes, Dr. Amos Wilson. Ooh. In a book called Developmental Psychology of the Black Child, Amos found research that white people did on black babies, but they never published it because in white science, you don't publish anything that contradicts white supremacy, even if it is the truth. And they found out that black infants were more advanced and more intelligent than any other child on the planet. But once our children begin formal public school, yes. guess what happens to the average IQ score of a black child in South Florida? Every year they go up in grade, the IQ drops five to ten points. Did you hear what I just said? I said, the longer your child is in public school, the dumber they become. Yep. As I close, and I hope this was beneficial. Was this beneficial? Yes. Take out your phone. Take out your phone, I'm going to give you my contact. You know, Last time I was in Fort Lauderdale, I ain't gonna tell y'all this story. <laughs> y'all know what I'm talking about. I met a certain young lady right here in Fort Lauderdale who was into a profession I wasn't conscious of. <laughs> that came out late. That's what Fort Lauderdale did to the prince. <laughs> Check it out. It started that day. Some of y'all saw it. I said, wait a minute, Doc. Ain't that the girl who waited for you at the end of the book signing line? Damn Skippy. <laughs> but that's in the past now. <laughs> <laughs> Let me give you the Tuesday morning call-in number. And that number is, this is Tuesday morning, 6 to 8 a.m., free answers to all your questions. Share it with as many black parents as you know. Even with white mothers raising black children, even with white fathers raising black children, if they're raising our children, they need the answers. I had a white mother call me up the other day. I'm white, will you help me? I got a black son. Of course I'm gonna help you. Not that way, but with your son. Because <laughs> I can feel the vibe. You know, you can feel. She was throwing me, so I didn't want that. Whoop! <laughs> Flatty Patty! <laughs> Tuesday morning number, 857 232. 0158. I repeat it twice more. 857 232 0158. Once more. 857 232 0158. When you call in, you need an access code because it's teleconference. And the access code is 870 864 pound. 870 864 pound. Last time for my special ed parents. <laughs> I'm picking which. 870 864 pound. If you didn't catch that, just catch my cell number, text me, and I'll text you the information. That cell number hasn't changed since my first trip to Africa in 2005. 215 989 9858. 215 989 985-215-989-9858. Donating to the school, you can do it online or by mail. Online is gofundme.com slash D-R-U-M-A-R. Gofundme.com slash Dr. Umar. You can mail them in, payable to FDMG Academy. Some of you already brought some checks in today. I appreciate you. FDMG Academy P.O. Box 6872, Philadelphia, PA, 19132. Make sure your phone.
phone number and email us on the check of money order because we open the school. Everybody who ever gave me a damn penny will have their name displayed in that school because when them doors open, we can say this ain't no charter, this ain't no public, we ain't get no grant from the Rockefellers, no money from the government. Black people built this thing. I want to leave you with a quote. I'm going to leave you with a quote. And once I'm done, Ms. Shalene going to get back on the mic for the final comments. And then I'm going to go into the hallway where there's more light. And I will start signing the books and taking the pictures. Okay? And if it's not raining outside, we might even go out into the sun because I'm a child of the sun and it's about to get cold in PA. And I need as much as I can get. Mm -hmm. We need to keep that pineal gland functioning. Okay? Frederick Douglass said, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom and deprecate agitation are like men who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want the rain but can't stand the thunder or the lightning. They want the ocean. But they're scared of the awful roar of this water. Frederick Douglass said, for 20 years I prayed on my knees to God for freedom. But the good Lord gave me no freedom until I got up off my knees and started praying with my feet. He said, if you want respect from white folks, why do you look for pity? The man who pities you will never respect you, and the man who respects you has no need for pity. Right. The Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey, leader of the largest black organization in modern history, the man who gave us the red, black, and green flag said, without confidence in self, you are twice defeated in the race of life. But with confidence, you have won even before you have started. Queen Mother Harriet Tubman said, after all those years of fighting in the Civil War and freeing in the Underground Railroad, I only got but one regret. I freed hundreds of you slaves. I could have freed thousands more. Problem is you Negroes didn't even know that you were slaves. South Florida, Fort Lauderdale, one love. Dr. Umar Johnson, I appreciate every one of you. And I'm going to see you outside. Thank you to Sister Micheline. Thank you to Sister Raylisha. Give it up, Thank give it you up. to Sister Shardisha. Black Power, make sure you get your book, your t-shirt, your flag, your DVD, your button. And yes, you can use a credit card. Black Power. Oh.